Chris Abdi, welcome to the show. How are you today? Doing well. How are you doing? I'm very, very well. Thank you so much for asking. Excited to dive into your expertise today. I feel that we're already having quite an interesting conversation off air. So I was like, we need to hit record and get this on air. So for anyone who hasn't come across you before, can you explain a little bit about who you are and what it is that you do? Yes. So I am a procrastination coach. What that means is I dive into specifically why um, you may be procrastinating or you know engaging in task avoidance. Or maybe you feel like you don't have enough time or you can't you know, get done what you want to get done or what you need to get done. So I, I help take you through uh, the different processes because uh, it's not just about how do I schedule my tasks or, or how do I fill my calendar. If you're not looking at you know, your, uh, your mindset, your energy levels, your focus, if you're not doing any of that, then you, know, you can fill your calendar all day. Anybody can do that. <laughs> I mean, how easy is it to fill your calendar, right? So uh, that is, uh, that's what I do. And then I just, I coach you uh, through the process. Uh, we go over your tasks, your calendar. We see if there's an issue there. And then we just line things up um, in terms of the best strategies for you to see how you can uh, really optimize your time and, and get back to either doing everything you need to do or, you know, even freeing up your time. I mean, a lot of times we feel like we don't have time or, or we feel guilty about taking time for ourselves. And we need that time for ourselves. You need that time to go to the gym. You need that time to eat properly. You need that time to sleep. So that's that's essentially what I do. Yeah, and I can imagine that this has stemmed from a personal story. Is that true? Oh, yeah. I am the, ma <laughs> I am the master procrastinator. And, and uh, you know, I'm not afraid to admit I, I still put certain things off. I mean, you know, it's just a human condition, right? We we don't necessarily want to put things off, but I mean, there are just certain things that subconsciously we do it all the time. I mean, uh, you know, if your mom calls, right? Or if you're, you know, or if one of your mates calls and then you're in the middle of something, right? We just put it off and we say, oh, we'll do it later. Oh, well, you know, it's, it's about prioritization and about uncomfortable, uh, just being uncomfortable, right? That's what it boils down to is that we tend to put things off that uh, we find uncomfortable or we are overwhelmed in some sense. And yeah, I was about to say that. Do you think in many ways it's not necessarily procrastination at times, but it's more prioritization, right? As much as I would love to answer the calls of my family every single time that I'm working, because they do have a tendency to call me in the middle of my work blocks, like I just have to prioritize my work in that moment because maybe it's my golden time where I know that I'm kind of most productive and I'm aiming to get back to it at a certain time in the day. But it's maybe if I'm putting all these different things in my schedule, it's less about them being a priority, but it's like, okay, well, these things need to take precedence at this time because of, in theory, I can call them at any time of the day and it doesn't really have to be at a certain hour, whereas this work might need to be delivered and I might have to give something to my clients. So how do you tell the difference between the prioritization side of things and the procrastination side of things? Well, my, uh, my, my, sort of response to that would be, okay, so when are you going to call your parents back? Well, when are you going to call your mom back? And if you can't answer that like that, that's, that's, you're, you're putting it off. You're, you're procrastinating for some reason. And do you think it's because of, again, about very, being very, very real? Is it a case of saying, well, actually, like I've got a lot of other things on my plate right now, or is it a sense of saying, well, in order to for it not to be something I'm putting off, it needs to have a slot. For example, even if we're on Wednesday today and I say, okay, well, it's going to happen on Saturday morning, even if that's four days away, would that not be classified as procrastinating if I put it in my diary, just, you know, kicking the can down, which I think a lot of people do. It uh, it really gets into the, the why, the reasoning behind it. I mean, it, again, it gets down to prioritization and how busy you get, but it can also be um, how often you kick the can. I mean, kicking the can once, I mean, it, it happens. Kicking the can twice, okay. Kicking the can three times, okay, you might want to look at why you're doing that. <laughs> yeah, absolutely. So dig a little bit deeper into your story, if you will. You mentioned that you were an enormous procrastinator. What I find with procrastinators as well, it's interesting. A lot of other things maybe in life, maybe if we're late all the time, we wouldn't label ourselves as someone who's, always, well, maybe we would, but I, it's not usually worn as like a badge of honor per se. If you're late or if you are someone who is a bit flaky, right? And they miss out on events all the time, but people kind of wear this procrastination badge with pride to a degree. Why do you think that is? And did you do the same? There, there are, there are two types of procrastinators. I, I tend to, um, 
label them. It, it's not very scientific. It's it's not very uh, you know professional, but. I categorize them in the, in these two types. There's the implosive and there's the explosive. So the implosive procrastinators are the procrastinators that are, I would consider more traditional, the, the more traditional route where, you know, they put things off because they're avoiding pain or they're avoiding uh, some sort of emotion. They're avoiding being uncomfortable and, and they tend to shut down. They move inwards and then they just don't get things done and it just snowballs into this big, you know, terrible instance. And then you have the explosive uh, procrastinators where they thrive on it. Like they will purposefully, you know, put things off to the last minute because they work well under pressure. You know, there's lots of brain chemistry going on there. There's endorphins, there's adrenaline. Uh, they feel like they can focus more and it's because they've got that strict timeline that they really, they really thrive like that. Yeah. It's interesting. And when it comes to procrastination as a whole, I think a lot of people maybe don't see it as such an issue because of they eventually get the thing done, right? Like in the end, they deliver. So why is it such a key to, let's say, having a fulfilling life? Like if at some point I call my family, at some point I get around to making the deadline, right? Even if I submit it 20 seconds before it needs to be there. Why is it such a problem if we end up getting the job done in the end? It is such a problem because it uh, it becomes habit. And then it, de it definitely leads to things where, you know, you can skid by for quite a while. I know I did. You can, you can skid by for quite a while. You can, uh, you know, rationalize things out the yin yang, you know, so to speak. In the end, what happens is it, is it eventually it will take over your life. Again, that, that might sound a little extreme, but you know, in, until you've experienced it, until you understand it, you, you really won't know. I mean, I have a very personal experience um, with uh, procrastination where it wasn't a sense of prioritization. You know, I was always, you know, busy working and, and, you know, doing the things I was supposed to be doing. Right. And uh, actually it was involving my mom and um, she's no longer with us. So what happened was I was going to go see her in the nursing home. I knew she wasn't well, um, and I, I kept putting it off. I kept putting it off because, you know, it was uh, an emotionally uncomfortable thing for me to deal with. And, um, you know, I gave the excuse that, you know, I was talking to the nurses and the doctors, and they said, oh, yeah, you know, she'll probably be okay. So I said, okay, I'll go Monday. Well, Sunday night. You know, she uh, she passes. So that's just the uh, it's just the nature of it, too. And, and, you know, I felt like it was OK because I would procrastinated in other areas of my life. And when we don't have any negative consequences, that's how habits get formed. And we say, oh, it'll be fine. You know, just like the last time. Right. Was that the tipping point for you? Did everything change thereafter? No, 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 no. That, that actually wasn't the tipping point for me. That was just an example. The, the tipping point for me was uh, I was feeling very very burned out because I, I'm a very interesting case. I started as an explosive and I turned into an implosive, which can also happen. Um, you know, I, I used to leave things to the last minute because, you know, I worked well under pressure and then uh, I took on a little more than I could handle. And then that's when things sort of started to get overwhelming and I started missing, started missing deadlines. And then, you know, you miss a couple, it's no big deal. You miss three and then, then it's uh, then it, it becomes a big deal. So, um, that for me was where I decided, you know, I, I had to figure out why, specifically in, the, in that case, why I was, uh, you know, procrastinating. And, and it's interesting because I noticed the shift between the, oh, I got to get this done to now when I've got five things that are overdue, it all of a sudden became the implosive kind rather than the explosive kind. Got you. Yeah, that does make sense. And you've got an interesting concept of the procrastination, the procrastination and the postcrastination as well. Those are terms I've not come across before. So can you explain those in a little bit more detail for us? Um, sure. Uh, procrastination is actually doing tasks as soon as they're assigned to you. No matter what it is, no matter when it comes in, you get it, you do it. You get it out, out the door as soon as possible. And um, that can actually be just as damaging because uh, there, there's no, normally there's no prioritization and, and you're working off of instant gratification. So uh, what happens is, is, is you'll often then, uh, you'll get inundated with tasks Potentially, this is usually what happens is, is you, you do that well for a while. And then all of a sudden you come across tasks that, that are a little bit bigger and take you a little longer to complete. And then as you're not finished, the one, another one comes in and boom, you're shifting your, your attention to the other one that seems to be easier, right? And uh, you're just trying to knock that out and then you'll knock that out, but then you'll forget or not, not, not really forget. You'll get back to the first one as it becomes more urgent. So 
the prioritization becomes a little bit uh, a little bit interesting there. Post procrastination is is interesting as well. It's not even technically a real term. <laughs> it's in the urban dictionary, but it's more about purposefully handing tasks in, you know, late or or after the fact. And it usually, usually it is on purpose. We might not say it is, but usually it's on purpose uh, just because you want to get things done. So you have a touch of, uh, you know, perfectionist in you maybe. And, and, you know, you say it's supposed to be done today, but you'll do it, you know, in two days because you want to make sure it's done right sort of deal. And obviously we can see where that can lead to problems. Absolutely. And do you feel that most procrastinators fit in all of these brackets or some fit in more, more than others? It really depends. There's a wide range. Post-crastination is more about you taking control of a situation. Pre-crastination is, is about being, you know, preemptive. And um, a lot of procrastinators that are implosive will tend to be pre-crastinators because, you know, they, they just want to get things done out of the way with the, the anxiety or the fear driving them that, you know, they don't want to have too much to do or they, they don't want to just the idea of having a pending task makes them just, you know, feel very anxious because they're not sure when they're going to get it done. Yes. Yeah, so those people who can't deal with their inbox being above zero, they're always fighting for that inbox zero. I, I get that. But also at the same time, I think that I don't know if you found this in your experience as well is that if you are super, super responsive and perhaps you're working in a company, then you almost get punished for your productivity you end up getting more piled on your plate because of you're the one who can deliver in a certain amount of time or even with emails it's very interesting in the work that i do as well quite often i have a client who asks a question four hours later they'll email me on that same chain and saying don't worry Elliot, i've already figured this out for myself whereas if i responded to it immediately it would be a case of me having to commit between five and 30 minutes or whatever it might be, depending on the task, when actually it can just solve itself with a little bit of time. And I can see where that becomes disruptive. No, for, for sure, for sure. And, and again, it, it's, uh, we live in a world of instant gratification too, right? So seeing that zero is very gratifying. It's something that we can hook onto. And it's just not, uh, it's just not sustainable because at some point we're going to be given a task that is just going to take a little longer. I mean, that's just the nature of the game. Eventually it's going to happen. Yeah. There's another term that I, I don't know if I came across it or if it was just came off the back of one of my journaling prompts or something along those lines, but I would imagine in your industry, you've probably heard of it as well, which is productive procrastination. When instead of doing the thing that you're supposed to be doing, you go and do something that looks very productive, but isn't actually helping you with a task at hand. So maybe I've got a pile of emails and then I go and clean my wardrobe, for example, or instead of doing that long essay I need to write, I go to the gym instead because if that's productive and that's helping me towards where I want to be. However, it's not actually the thing that I need to do. So how often do you see people productive procrastinating and where does that fit into the pre pro and post or does it? It does to a certain extent that is, um, it fits into distraction and it, it, a lot of it goes back to again, task avoidance or instant gratification as well. So what, uh, what happens is that when you get these tasks, if you feel like you don't know how you're doing it and there, there is some science to back that productive procrastination can be helpful in some instances. I, I like to say that with a grain of salt because people twist your words. <laughs> but <laughs> but um, if you are 100% focused on, uh, on an issue, and the mind is a very beautiful thing, but it can be very frustrating at times. I'm sure you've come up across the same issue. You're working on a task and then you, you just, you've been at it for like eight hours straight and you just can't think of anything else to do. So some people sort of flip that on its head. And in some cases, and you know, not all, in some cases, when you get a big task, like you're writing a thesis or you're preparing for a show or you're doing something um, that requires some sort of creativity, then by going and doing something that you enjoy, you're, you're actually processing it subconsciously. So that when you do and you go and you actually start, you're saying, oh, yes, okay, there's that. It, it's a very fine line between that and then I, I also don't really recommend that just because I'm a big advocate for mindfulness and being focused on what you're doing. But it does seem to work for some people's creative process. And the subconscious mind is an amazing thing. And if yours works that way and you're lucky enough for it to work that way, then... Yeah, you can make it work for you. Got you. Yeah, that makes a lot of sense. Now I want to allow the people who maybe don't identify this in their life, because I think pro 
productive procrastination is quite a tricky one. You know, initially it just seems like you're doing all these things. It's amazing. Like, look how clean my house is. Look how clean my car is. Look how clean my bed is and everything along those lines. But then you have a bunch of other things piling up, making a mess in other areas of your life. And that on the outside looking in, or maybe at first glance, doesn't look like procrastinating behavior it just looks at you being productive in certain areas of life and not so much in in certain other ones so what are some of the most common forms of procrastination that we see what is maybe some of the most uncommon forms that we see that disguise themselves and allow us to not think it's procrastination when it really is yeah so we we like to we like to trick ourselves when we say that we're being productive and we just don't get to everything in, in a certain day right so the most common types of procrastination that that well, that I see are, you know, they're mainly tied around some sort of trauma or they're tied around some sort of emotional, um, emotional pain or past history with pain. Like I, I have somebody who said, you know, they were on top of their game. They always had everything. Like you said, their, their house was clean. Their, their relationships were good or whatever. And, um, the thing they were putting off was proposing to their fiance and they've been putting it off for five years. Like, uh, and they, they didn't really think it was that big a problem, but I mean, it's, it was a form of procrastination and it actually went back to, um, back to their childhood where, um, they came from divorced parents and, and, you know, the, the problems really actually started after, um, after the marriage, right? So I'm sorry, I, I missed part of the story there. So the problem started, they was divorced parents. They got married again. It was a mixed family, but everything was fine. They were mixed together. They were, um, you know, fiance and everything was fine. Then as soon as they had that ceremony, everything just, you know, for X, Y, Z reason just fell apart and that stuck with them. And, you know, it's not even something they were actively thinking about. It's just, uh, it was just something that was there. And uh, some of the most uncommon forms of procrastination that I've seen, <laughs> believe it or not, uh, I have somebody that, that uh, I had somebody that didn't want to finish anything. They literally, I mean, I know we talk about pro uh, procrastination in that they, they couldn't finish anything, but it was actually to the point where, you know, they, they wouldn't finish a meal. They would leave like one Cheeto in a bag. It, it was that kind of thing. And, and, you know, it was very strange because they didn't want to complete things because they felt that, you know, once it was complete, they were worried about not having anything to do. And so it, it, that, that has definitely got to be the, the most uh, interesting case I've, I've come across because that's procrastination on purpose because you're worried about not having anything to do, which is a statistical impossibility. But, um, you know, the, you know, the fear was there, right? So they just, they didn't finish anything. They left everything at like 98, 99%. Yeah. Maybe it's something that they put us down as nothing that's worth doing, right? Because of them, maybe they can no longer distract themselves and then they have to entertain the dark <laughs> corners of their mind, right? Because if, if they have nothing to do, then, you know, what else is there to occupy the mind that's probably very active and very busy? Well, yeah, dive deeper into that. That was a client, right? So you dove deeper into that. What did you find, if you don't mind revealing that, beneath the surface of not wanting to finish anything? Yeah, so you you're you're pretty close. They didn't want to. They didn't want to have nothing to do because they they had a very um, a very big tie to to self worth, and they figured that if they were doing nothing, then they were worth nothing. It didn't matter what that thing was they always had to be doing something, even even if it wasn't productive. And it, it stemmed from, in, in their childhood, how they were never paid, nobody ever paid attention to them in the house unless they were doing something. So if they were doing nothing, they felt invisible. And it just, it was just this, this um, it, it was very interesting. And uh, again, it was, but it was more tied towards internal validation, if that, if that makes sense. Yeah. Makes a lot of sense. Makes all the sense, to be honest. And it's interesting how we can always link it back to something. So how did you start pulling on that thread? I'm curious about, okay, we get started. We see that someone's not finishing anything. And are they relatively self-aware? I'm imagining that some people are very aware of the reasons why they do things, but other people, you have to kind of pull on that thread until you get the insights. So did you have to pull quite hard on that thread or did they have some idea of that? I'll be honest with you. I had to pull at a lot of threads because I was, because it didn't even really start with that. It, it was, um, you know, I was, they, they were talking to me. They, they, um, the, the first thing was, is, is that they would leave five minutes, five minutes before we, we finished our session. And, and so I was asking like, Hey, what, you know, what, what happened? You know, we were talking, everything was good. You, you all right. 
It's like, oh, yeah, I just, I just don't finish it. So, okay, so what makes you not want to finish it? It's like, well, I, won't have so- I want to have something to talk about next time. And I said, you know, well, you, you don't have to worry about that. I mean, there, there's always plenty to talk about. There's, you know, you're never going to be sitting in silence. And, and then so we sort of worked on that for a bit. And then, um, you know, he, we noticed that it, it stretched into other areas, too. And so, you know, you, have, you start asking the questions, well, OK, so what do you feel when you do that? And, and it was interesting because uh, at first it was, oh, you know, I feel nothing. What do you mean nothing? I mean, you, you, you've got to be, you know, there's got to be some sort of feeling that you're getting, some sort of impulse that, that, that you're doing this, you're doing it. And, and then they, they went into, they said, yeah, well, you know, I, it, and it was interesting. So it's like, you know, I, I feel, I feel like I, I've accomplished something if I leave something there for me to do tomorrow. And that, and that's sort of like, well, okay, well, you know, why? And then, and then, and then that, then they had this sort of breakthrough moment where they, they realized that, and it was so difficult getting to that point though, you know, and they said, oh, and they said, oh, okay, it's because if I don't have anything to do, then, you know, I'm not going to be worth any, you know, worth anything or anybody's time. And, and, you know, then we sort of, you know, dove into that and it became, you know, kind of a, a referral, a little bit of a referral case too, because I'm dealing with the procrastination side, not the, you know, not the therapy side. And, and that... I mean, we did work a lot together, but in the end, yeah, that does require a little bit more uh, deep, deep work. Yeah. Do you find that with kind of almost everyone, though? Because I'm the same in the health and fitness industry. I do my best to stay in my lane and think that, well, actually, I don't even think at this stage. I'm all very aware that at some point with someone's fitness or their nutrition that we are going to hit a stop at some type of trauma, right? And whether it's a big T or a small T, it, it's going to happen sooner rather than later. So do you find that that kind of almost always happens? Because it does in my industry, that's for sure, is that it's always linked back to something and it's usually quite something that's very deeply embedded within them. It does. It does happen quite a bit. It doesn't tend to happen as much in, in cases that are less severe. I'm sure it happens the same in, in your industry as well. I mean, when when you talk about procrastination, I mean, it, it could just be like energy levels. But when you when you do hit the trauma, it's, it's generally the more severe cases. So people that, that can't, um, they can't even bring themselves to look at a calendar or they can't bring themselves to even, you know, get out of bed in the morning to schedule anything or, or to go to things. That's where, you know, that's why in, in uh, discovery calls and, and sessions, you, you ask them, you're like, okay, so is this something that is, you know, preventing you from functioning at all? Because if it's something that's preventing you from functioning at all, then, you know, that's, that's a pretty big indicator that it, it's, you know, somehow trauma related. At some point, going to need to broach that subject and just say, you know, I have somebody that you can work with on this because before you work on that, we're not really going to be able to work on the other stuff. Yeah, yeah, that definitely makes sense. So let's go to the solutions now and the resolutions. And obviously now I think a lot of people will be able to identify that if they hadn't already. Like I said, I think a lot of people are quite self-aware around their procrastinating behaviors, maybe not the entirety of it all, and maybe they downplay it a little bit, but they're generally aware. So what are some of the steps that you take with your clients to move in the direction of where they want to go? I can imagine a lot of it's first asking why you're procrastinating in the first place and also looking into the different types of behaviors that you're procrastinating in versus some of the others. So explain that process of how you start to unravel that and then lead them towards more productivity, I guess is the word, in the tasks that they choose. Right. So it's generally generally a three-step process. So the first step is to really dig into, like you said, where where they feel the, the issue is. So they'll, they'll tell me where they feel the issue is and then we'll, we'll go through that together and we'll see if it's their tasks or if it's, you know, the calendar or if it's, uh, certain, certain situations or certain activities that, that it always happens with. And then, yes, you do focus on, uh, you first focus on your mindset. You make sure you, so you check to see if there's any limiting beliefs. You check to see if there's any emotional ties to that. You check to, and then after that, you check on the energy levels. So you ask them, okay, so, well, energetically, how do you feel when you think about doing this task? Energetically, how are you after you do this task? When you're doing this task, are you, are you doing it at a time of day when you know you've, you're, you've got enough energy to do it? Um, which is something a lot of people don't even consider. I mean, it, we go about our day, we prioritize our list, and we say, this has to be done first because, you know, it, it's the most important. 
But I would counter that and say that, you know, if this is something that's going to be emotionally taxing for you and it's going to, you know, drain you to such an extent that you won't be able to do the other things on your list that day, then even though it's the most important, it would make sense to move that to another part of the day when you know that afterwards you're not going to need to do anything else. I like that. Yeah, I like that a lot. And is there a way in which we can make ourselves more resilient at this? Because I've found this with myself in certain ways. I sometimes tell my wife that I just need to shut up and get on with it. Like I, I tell myself that quite a lot to kind of build a bit of a threshold because of sometimes you find yourself like you kind of create these stories in your mind more so than really not wanting to do it or anything along those lines. And I find that like, if I just stop entertaining the conversation in my mind and put myself in front of my laptop or wherever it might be in the certain section of my life, I'm usually able to do it. And it might, and this is when it's not around any specific task. This is maybe when there is just a pile of things to do. Maybe there's like, yeah, a little bit of overwhelm that there's, that's involved there. But then usually I just tell her, like, I just need to sit down and do it. Like that's usually my solution. I felt, and I found that that builds a little bit more of a, a threshold. You become a little bit better at, moving through that list of course there's definitely a argument for optimization right you don't want to be doing the super super difficult things at 8 p.m at night and then leaving the super easy things to the morning but is there an argument for that and building the threshold by just kind of a little bit of sucking it up and getting it done uh yes the old suck it up buttercup uh <laughs> right a lot of a lot of that though what you're talking about a lot of that re uh, revolves around you know just taking your power back because what you're doing when you do that is you're just taking your power back so you're, you're saying, I just got to sit down and do it. So in your mind, you're actually in a very roundabout way, you're saying you're taking ownership and you're saying, I am choosing to do this. Now, when you say that, that, you know, uh, maybe we can do a little bit of, of a little bit of experiment here on the show, if you want, if you don't mind. Of course. So why don't you pick something that you don't necessarily like doing, but something that you have to do? Okay. Got it. Okay. Now in your mind, say, I have to do this. Okay. Okay, now how did that feel? I felt some resistance. That did. And I was like, oh, okay. Little. <laughs> okay. Now I want you to do one simple one simple tweak. I want you to take that half to and I want you to replace it with I choose to. It feels more empowering. And then it even it'll get even more empowering if you attach a reason to it, a good reason to it. Mm. So why are you doing it? So I'm choosing to do this because Yeah. And then when and then when you sit and when you sit back and you and you sort of take back your power that way then then you'll find that um you won't hit as you won't hit you'll still hit some but you won't hit as much resistance and the more that you actually sit you actually sit in your power the more that you'll be able to do these things that you don't like and and you'll be able to maybe look at them in a different light and be able to you know move them around which is essentially what you were doing by just saying oh i just i'm just gonna sit, sit down and suck it up it's just in a in a, in a more tough love way <laughs> That tends to be sometimes the way I work, but I found that also like, it's also not just doing this and not saying, okay, well, every single, um, solution needs this like hammer approach, right? Like that's not the reality. Like I've worked out that, okay, if it's getting to 6, 7 PM at night and I'm still working, then it's probably wise to be doing something that doesn't take too much of my mental energy, right? It's like something that needs to be done, but it's more passive. It's, it's a little easier to do. And it's maybe like, I don't know, something around social media, for example, which doesn't, like if I'm editing videos or something along those lines, that doesn't take an incredible amount of headspace to do it. Whereas I'm not going to be taking an interview like this, for example, or I'm not going to be writing, you know, the best newsletter I ever want to put out. It's more a sense of saying, okay well you know client work and all that type of stuff gets pushed to the early stages of the day and if i know that my energy is going to dip rather than trying to put something in there that's going to require a lot of mental load i then put something that also still needs or I, I still choose to do because i want to but it just requires a little less mental energy and i find that that comes with a lot less resistance as well because i'm like ah perfect i get to do the easy work now and that just feels a lot lighter to my brain and my mind oh no for sure and that that's a very good way to do it another thing that you can do is is really dive into those tasks that you you feel like they take a lot of a lot of headspace or they you feel like they take a lot of an emotional drain on you they drain you and looking at why they drain you and then just seeing if there's a way that you can sort of flip that around and make it an energizer too or you you sandwich it um you know sometimes uh, there's this, there's the sandwich technique too where if you know that you know uh it's a very uh mentally and you know um, emotionally draining task, but you have to do it at 1 p.m. So, okay, well, you know, as, as they say, well, okay, I have to, you know, 
So first of all, you said, I'm choosing to do this. But then what you do is you sandwich in, I don't know, maybe some personal time before, some personal time after, something that you actually like doing so that you're, you know, you're giving yourself a little bit of a buffer before you hit that, that thing that you don't necessarily, you know, that, that thing that's going to be draining you. Yeah, because it's interesting because of, I would say the podcasts don't drain me per se, but I know that I have to be focused. And quite often, like this morning, for example, I had three back to back. And what I usually do is I leave 15 minute breaks in between. And before I would, you know, jump back onto my emails, send across some emails. But now I just pretty much, like, I go grab myself a coffee. I go talk to my wife, for example. So I like that sandwich approach because of that makes it feel lighter to the point where I get to the next one. I'm like rejuvenated in a way. And it's not that I'm not looking forward. I actually really enjoy. I just know that I need to be on top form. I want to be able to articulate myself the best. I want to be able to ask the best questions as possible. So by adding those soft edges in between, yeah, that's, that's proven to be beneficial. So, so I like that take. And then transitioning onto mindfulness, you have mentioned that maybe one or two times throughout the course of the conversation so far. What role does mindfulness play in procrastination and productivity? Well, mindfulness is that, that goes down to, um, that goes down to focus and uh, what I like to call energy management too. So we all do, and this is something that I, I really hate and, and something that I'm trying to get out of. Like all the corporate clients that I see, if I have the ability to just go to their department head and say, if you say multitask one more time, I'm going to stick my foot somewhere you don't like. <laughs> because multitasking is, is uh, it's counterintuitive and counterproductive, right? So mindfulness really comes in by helping us stay rooted in the present moment. And we stay rooted in the present moment so that we can stay focused because if you put 100% in, you're going to get 100% out. I'll give you an, uh, just, just a quick example. I had somebody at, uh, at one of the corporate events. They said they, they didn't understand, you know, their wife was complaining all the time. This isn't my, even my area, you know, this is my wheelhouse. This is a relationship now. And, and uh, you know, he said, uh, I do all this family time and they still complain. You know, I, I do the work. I, I, you know, I'm not working overtime. You know, what's wrong? And he, as he's talking to this group of people, He's on his cell phone. He's on Facebook. He's, he's doing this other stuff. And, it's, and, and you know, I, I just sort of said, well, do you do that when you're with your family? He said, well, yeah, I got to keep up. I, this is the only time I have to keep up to date with things. I said, I said okay, so, you, so what amount of your attention is going into that right now as opposed to the conversation we're having? He's like, oh, I'm usually giving you 80%. Like, okay, does your family deserve 80%, you know? Um, is the work that you're doing when you, when you're actually working, are you giving a hundred percent? Well, of course I'm at work. Okay. So why can't you give that with your family? <laughs> like, um, and, and again, you know, we're all guilty of this to some extent because, you know, I got called out on it by my daughter. <laughs> <laughs> she, uh, she actually, uh, cause I was telling my wife this story and she turns to me, she, um, my daughter turns around to me and she's like looking at me and she's like, give me this look. I'm like, what? She's like, you do that all the time. Like, what do you mean? Like when we're at, like, not all the time, but when we were in the car and we were having a conversation, I was checking emails. He was like, well, you do that too. Like, you know what? Yeah. Okay. Yeah. You got me. So, I mean, we're so ingrained with multitasking that we don't even really pay attention to when we're doing it or when we're not doing it. But mindfulness really plays a part because if you can focus and stay in the present moment, it doesn't leave room for um, for anxiety or depression because depression's in the past and anxiety's in the future, right? So as long as you're focused on the task at hand, you're not anxious about the outcome of the task. You're not anxious about you know what's coming next. You're just focused, and you'll find that your quality goes up, and it doesn't take you as long to do things. Because if I'm on my phone, if I'm talking to you, I'm on my phone and I'm writing, uh, I don't know, I'm writing an email. I'm giving what? 33% of my effort to each of those. And it's actually taking me maybe 10 minutes to write that email when, you know, I could have been done in three minutes because I'm having to go back and reread and make sure I didn't make any mistakes. So uh, mindfulness plays a very big part in procrastination because it, it means that we can be stay rooted in the present moment and not get distracted. Distraction it was a big part of procrastination. And as long as you can stay focused, then um, you can actually push through and actually get that awareness like you were talking about too. And just understand, so if you're feeling that resistance, you're more able to deal with it because you're fully there, you're fully present, you're able to reconcile that within yourself. And do you think it's more challenging in our modern world with all the technology and all the distractions that we have? Or is this just an ever-existing issue that 
this is just the current problem. You know, let's say something else was the problem in the past. Like, I feel that I don't want to say that we have it worse or Gen Z have it worse or uh, Gen Alpha have it worse, right? But I can see the challenges that they would have with a phone at their hand and the TikTokification of everything compared to maybe when you and I were growing up. Like I eventually got a cell phone, but I lived a lot of my life without it at once at this age. So is that a lot harder now? And is it much more exacerbated by technology at our fingertips at every single moment? Oh, I'm, I'm, I'm sure that uh, technology def- definitely exasperates it just because, you know, 20, 30 years ago, you know, we wouldn't be inundated with all this, all the information that we're inundated with today. There weren't, there weren't as many distractions. I mean, it's not that we wouldn't get distracted. We couldn't get distracted. It's just that now everything's vying for your attention. You've got all these apps, notifications, applications, um, phone, you know, the phone ringing, advertisements, kids in school, you know, we, it, it's very, it's actually goes into a discussion I had on, on ADHD. And, and, um, you know, how kid, you know, these children don't have ADHD, but well, some of them don't, it's just that, you know, they're just so used to being distracted. Our brains are wired to look for distraction because every, you know, we're, we're being hardwired by social media to have 30 second attention spans. So of course we're going to get distracted. We're looking to get distracted every 30 seconds. And what do you believe the answer to for this is, especially for the younger generation or even the older generation, right? Like I see people my age and older addicted to their phones to a degree and like stuck on them, glued to them. And obviously the answer is not to take away technology because of you and I would not be having this conversation without technology and a lot of connections wouldn't be made without technology and especially for the kids growing up as well. Like I think there was even a stat that I heard the other day is that many kids are sleeping between six to seven hours per day, but they're spending eight to 12 hours on screens. So they're actually spending more time on screens than they are sleeping, which is kind of insane to a degree, but at the same time, like I can kind of resonate it with the work that I do, but to be a kid and be in that position is kind of mind blowing as well. So is there an antidote? What do you think it is? I mean, that's a difficult question. I, I don't really think there's an antidote um, because all you're really doing is delaying it. Um, the only thing that you can really do is, is educate. Even the, there's been to some extent where some of these, these famous people, uh, Elon Musk, uh, Bill Gates, they said that, that um, in their home, they don't allow their kids to, to use technology until, you know, until they're like a certain age, right? I mean, if they're doing it, it's probably a reason. So the, the answer is, is definitely trying to educate from a young age and, and trying to monitor and trying to limit um, screen time. There are several apps that have tried this as well, um, where you, you control how much time. Google's doing it right now. You can control how much time your, your child is able to use certain applications and how long they're able to use their phone. And that could help to a certain extent, um, but it, it's very, uh, it's very hands on and it doesn't, it doesn't carry over. So the only thing you can do is really help them to develop these habits early on so that they're used to it so that when they're, they're out on their own, they hopefully those habits carry on. Yeah. And maybe another aspect is also, well, you probably know better than I will because I don't have kids at this moment and you do, but maybe making world outside technology as incentivizing as the world inside technology as well. And I get that their social circle and their friends are all living on there as well. But for example, you can't play sport on your phone and sport is pretty damn fun if you find the one that you want to do, right? So maybe there's argument for that as well. And maybe the mindfulness pieces you just mentioned could be another one as well. If we can instill that into children as well so that they know when to take a beat from their cell phones and everything along those lines. Could that be advantageous when it comes to kids of like developing their routines and their habits with mindfulness built into it as well? Maybe part of it is the fact that most technology use is just like, I'll stick an iPad in front of the kid or don't limit the amount of time that they spend on the phone, etc. cetera. There, there is that. Um, I, I'm going to say something that's not going to be very popular, mm, <laughs> and, that, and I'm I'm in this I'm I'm in this group too, so I'm, I'm guilty of it. A lot of the time, technology has been a crutch and, and just a, a, a quick fix. I mean, back in back when we were kids, sometimes our parents would stick us in front of the TV. You know, we'd say we were raised by the TV, right? But now now it's gotten to the point where it's a little worse because we'll give them the phone because TV back then didn't have on-demand content, didn't have on-demand 
cartoon show. So it also wasn't portable, which is a major thing. Yeah. And, and so, you know, we might be watching six hours of TV a day, but we weren't watching six hours of TV a day because an ad would come on, we'd get up, we'd move around, we'd do other things. Um, if we didn't like the ad, right. And, and uh, we, then we go back and watch the show because our attention spans are bad. Now, it, it, the ads are integrated into the show and, and kids don't need to watch ads because they can go to the next thing immediately. And so they're, they're getting that six to eight hours, you know, consistently, you know, technology is, is being the parent and not you. Right. And again, I'm, I have been guilty of doing that in the past too. So I'm not judging anybody, but it is, it is a very difficult habit to get out of. But yes, yeah, so like you said, you know, getting them into a routine, uh, actually my, uh, my daughter just went to Taekwondo. You know, so, uh, you know, it teaches them focus and gets them, gets them interacting in, in the real world. And the more that we can do that and the more that we can make them present, the more that we can actually help them to not get into these uh, distraction modes. And it's difficult at first. I mean, it, it, like you said, it literally is an addiction. I've dealt with this, um, you know, with my own daughter. I've dealt with this with uh, other children as well. Just try and take the tablet away from them. You know, like, like an eight year old, an eight year old boy who doesn't want to go out, out and play on a Saturday, you know, like in our day, you know, we had the TV and, you know, maybe a, maybe a game console or something, but you know, we didn't have unlimited entertainment at our fingertips. Now you take it away. It's like taking away the, you know, digital crack, you know, <laughs> like, yeah, well, this is the challenge as well, because of, you know, you'll see those gamers who are earning millions of dollars and making a career out of that, the Twitch streamers, the YouTubers and everything like that. So you're like, on one hand, you want to let your child live in the real world. But at the same time, you see the immense amount of opportunities in the digital world. And now they're seeing that as a feasible, like if I said, I wanted to be a YouTuber at three years old, it would be like, who, what is YouTube? You know, like, but now they can. So that's kind of where, you know, the parenting conundrum comes in. It's like, well, you know, if you take away their technology, are you kind of putting a disadvantage in place because of the other kids are spending more time on that game than they maybe therefore they're going to be the top Twitch streamer because of that or are you balancing them out to the point where they've actually got other things going on in their life and they're actually going to live a more fulfilling life so yeah, I get the conundrum for sure and it's, it's it's a very interesting topic so I'm glad that we spoke about it and I want to come back before we do begin to start wrapping up mindfulness practices what are some of the most effective that you found for overcoming procrastination so it, it really depends on on the type of person that you are. So if you're a visual person, if you're a visual person, meditation and breath work can work. If you are uh, more of a tactile person, I, I was dealing with a, a client that uh, they couldn't stand meditation or breath work. They were more a tactile person. So there was actually a very simple, a very simple uh, little, little mind hack that, they, that you can do. And they just close their eyes and they, they take their fingers and they focus and they just rub their fingers together while focusing on the ridges of their fingers. And by focusing on that, they can bring themselves back into their body, back into just being present and, and grounded in, in that present moment. Um, some people are auditory. Uh, if you're auditory, then uh, one of the ways to become really present is to focus on the, on the sounds around you. There, there's, many, there's many different kinds. And actually, um, in traditional therapies, they try to hit all five. So they always see like, like for bringing you back to the present moment and, and calming panic attacks, they try to hit all five. So they would do, you know, what's what are five things that you see? You know, what are four things that you can hear? Three things that you can uh, smell. Two things you can taste, you know. There's five things you can see, four things you can touch, three things you can hear, two things you can taste, and one thing you can, uh, you know, sm no, one thing you can taste, two things you can smell. And by the time you get down to what you can taste, you know, you're, you're pretty grounded in, in the current moment because you're putting all your focus on, well, what the heck can I taste? <laughs> like... Depending on where you are, right? Yeah, absolutely. Kind of you're forced into a present to a degree. Any others that come to your mind? Anything like journaling? Anything like maybe just getting outside for a walk? Are those some effective forms of mindfulness? One of the best things I've found, actually, and, and it's, it's very interesting because I've done a lot of research on it, is, uh, is grounding. Grounding and just being in nature and uh, connecting, connecting to nature. So if you're actually outside, and you take your socks and your shoes off and you're standing in the grass or in the sand or wherever you are. I'm not the expert on it, but when you're doing that, you're actually engaging with the electromagnetic fields of your body and of the earth itself. And it, it just helps to bring you back and helps to bring the, the excess energies back out. And 
this helps you to to have some focus and, and um, it's a very interesting YouTube video um, it was called uh, it was called grounding and uh, they, he was saying that you know to be present we should walk around barefoot all day just because then you're being more you're being more connected and, and you know is it the energy thing is it that they're being more careful because they, they know that their feet aren't protected anymore you know whatever the case may be it, it is definitely one of the uh, one of the most uh, effective methods of being in, in the moment for sure when it comes to procrastination and productivity and all the things that are involved in this world do you see us heading in a more positive direction or do you think that there is still a bit of a rock bottom to hit before we start heading in the right direction because if i think that within the productivity world and the productivity landscape everything has been so hyper optimized to the point where it's becoming a little bit tiresome and maybe people are so tied to their calendars that they're actually then becoming a slave of their calendars versus actually living a well-rounded productive life which they were looking for in the first place and then when it comes to procrastination we spoke a little bit off air about you know ai potentially taking over people's jobs and now they're wondering whether they should have even taken the path into what they have done so do you see us heading for a bright horizon or is there still <laughs> some work to do oh there, there's there's always a bright horizon there, there, there always is a bright horizon but it, it is cyclical okay everything is cycles and, um, you know, it doesn't matter what you talk about, everything's a cycle. We still, yes, we still do have to hit a rock bottom. I think that it will be, it'll be hard, but I think it'll be fast. So that, that's kind of the silver lining. Just because we, uh, we are more open to discussing these things and we are more open to, to being vulnerable and to actually, you know, admitting, you know, when, when we have an issue, right? Um, I think COVID did that. So, in terms of procrastination and, and just in terms of productivity in general, yes, we are going to hit a we are going to hit a hump because we're going to hit resistance to change. We're going to hit resistance to uh, you know what's coming, and then you know then we hit acceptance, and then we'll we'll start to you know figure out where we fit in again, and we will have that bright horizon that everybody's looking for. I love it. I'm glad that the optimism is there, but with a little bit of realism, saying that you know we still got to hit a bump on the way to get to where we're going. And this has been a really insightful and fascinating conversation, Chris. I really appreciate your insights on procrastination. It is a topic that I find pretty fascinating and probably not discussed enough, to be honest. So with that being said, I have a couple of two final questions for you. And the first is what impact do you want to have on the world with the work that you do? The impact that I want to have is, is I believe everybody has the capability <clears throat> to live a, a productive, authentic, you know, fulfilling life. And uh, a lot of procrastination actually comes down to where maybe trying to do things that just don't align with our core values. You know, that, that's uh, the, one, of the, one of the major causes of procrastination, at least in my life it was too. Um, you know, we just tend to do things or we tend to get roped into things <laughs> that, you know, we don't necessarily feel like, you know, we want to do or that just don't resonate with us. And that comes back to, you know, um, taking back your power for the things that you absolutely can, you cannot avoid because, you know, they have to be done. So take back your power. And then coming into just looking at the things that maybe you're doing that just don't align with you and see if there's a different way you can do them. I like it. I like it a lot. And where is the best place for people to find you if they want to keep up with the work that you're doing, Chris? Oh, yes. Um, you can catch up with uh, my work on procrastinationnation.ca or you can uh, you can reach out directly by uh, by email chris at procrastinationnation.ca as well. Amazing. Amazing. Any plans for any... You don't have any social media by the sounds of it. Is that intentional or...? Yeah, I'm not a, I'm not a big advocate of social media. I do have a LinkedIn, but um, I try to stay off Facebook. I try to stay off Instagram. Instagram, it's kind of, I kind of equate it to being like, uh, like, a, like a sponsor who's in Alcoholics Anonymous. And, and if I'm the one that's drinking, well, you know. I like it. Practicing what you preach. Very, very nice. Well, we'll make sure that we find you in those two locations. But Chris, thank you so much for your time today. I really, truly appreciate it. Hey, no problem. Thanks for having me, Elliot.